joining me on this panel. And by the way, the, the fun part about panels is you get to jump in as well. I have my pigeonhole laptop here. And if you want to join us, send me a question. The password is MMP1. So my money, panel one, MMP1, OK? Send in your questions and uh, join in the conversation. Joining me on this panel, you know Mr. David Gerald. Also, Mr. Chu Chin Yi of SGX Redco, Professor Jeremy Go of SMU, and you just heard the wonderful Kui Juan from DBS. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. I want to start by putting this in context. Investing is about managing risks, and there are always trade-offs, right? Because we're aiming for a goal. We want to send that child to university. We want to prepare for a brilliant retirement, although I doubt Mr. David Gerald will ever retire. <laughs> <laughs> but the playing field for investing needs to be fair and transparent. How can we advance this goal? We heard earlier, Mr. Gerald, about the case of Klob. Uh, that was back in the 90s, yeah? 1999, so 20 years on. What are your views of the biggest potential pitfalls that investors need to be aware of? Like, but like this, uh, it has been said many, many times, you, the biggest pitfall is really greed. Do not rush into any investments because you see the returns are very high. All right? So that is always very attractive and, and uh, tempting. But if it is too good to be true, it is so. You must avoid, you know, uh, being, uh, jumping into anything because of returns. But the earlier speakers have outlined and many, many uh, investment seminars you have learned that, as I said, know yourself, know the product, and then know the strategies. So the biggest pitfall is greed, really, Stu. Okay. We have the questions coming in hard and fast. Wonderful. Please keep sending them through. I'll get to them in just a while. But first, I want to turn to Chin Yi. You are a regulator. You are the managing director of SGX Regco. That is an independent subsidiary of Singapore Exchange. How is SGX protecting investor rights, particularly in light of greed that David Gerald just raised? Well, when we talk about investor rights, a lot of this revolves around uh, two parts of the equation. In, in terms of the market. One part is, of the equation is how much can we empower the investors to make proper and reasonable assessments of their investments. That deals a lot with the information disclosure that companies come up with. and also deals with uh, the credibility of the information that comes out of the company. Second part, of course, the investors must be able to act on the information through engagement AGMs, as we've heard Mr. Gerald uh, set out just now, and through using their powers to vote on the commercial uh, initiatives that the company uh, puts forth. So a lot of the efforts we've put in place uh, in over the years has been to uh, solidify the framework of our disclosure rules, where it relates to technical information like valuation reports, for example. We've secured uh, MOUs with experts such as the SISV and IVAS, so that we have an independent third-party panel experts to look at valuation reports and to tell us whether the reports were prepared in accordance with the applicable standards and that re investors can rely on them. Other things that we can do, which are on a case-to-case -case basis, is where we spot information deficiencies in disclosure. We have issued what we call notices of compliance to companies to require further action. Sometimes it's in the form of further more detailed disclosures. Other times, if the state of affairs it's not as clear or we think it's more desirable, we will require special auditors to be appointed. And in cases where we think it's very necessary, we require special auditors to report directly to RECCO. Now, through these measures, we want to, as far as possible, give investors information they can trust and information they can rely on. And where we feel there is a need to level the playing field more, what we've done is that we've changed our listing rules such as in the case of uh, voluntary delistings, which Mr. Gerald also touched on in his presentation just now. So now all offers have to be fair and reasonable, supported by an independent financial advisor's report explaining why it's fair and why it's reasonable, and majority shareholders cannot vote on it. So minority shareholders are given more ability to uh, act on their rights as part owners of the company. But to be really robust, we do need the participation of investors in engaging with the company management 
in asking the questions they need to ask to understand the companies better. Because at the end of the day, the regulatory framework we have in Singapore is to ensure that you get the information you need to make a proper decision. What the regulator cannot do is to make a commercial judgment on behalf of the shareholders. And that's key. I think the best protection is knowledge. The investor must have knowledge and be educated on the investment. And that you are protected, mostly. On that theme of you know, investors stepping up and holding companies to account as well, Professor, you, you wrote a paper called The Effectiveness of Institutional Activism. Do you think that activism is a key part of answering that question of how we can advance investor interests? No. Yes, I would. Oh, yeah. Wow, I'm impressed. Uh, you actually dig up that paper I wrote a long time ago. Uh, actually, uh, shareholder activism is key because uh, the uh, investors can really put pressure on the uh, firm uh, to really uh, do the right thing. You know, I mean, earlier when we talk about, uh, you hear uh, chairman talk about, uh, you know, changing the shareholder and just flipping around and, uh, and making uh, stakeholders instead of uh, shareholders and a lot of things will fall into place, right? So as a shareholder, as activist, as uh, a stakeholder, you know, uh, if you, band together as an association, like, like, like what we have. We are very fortunate to have CIAS in uh, Singapore that could speak you know, on behalf of the investors. As indiv individual investors, I mean, the most you can do is attend AGM, go there kicking, screaming, and it doesn't solve any problem at all. But collectively, if you support a, a, a group you know, like uh, CIAS giving you a voice, the activism can really work. You know? I, I, I wrote a paper that actually shows that that, that firms do listen. Thank you for that. So, uh, the best way to be an activist is join CS, yeah? Yeah, that's mm, true. <laughs> hey. Kujon, in your role at DBS, you are helping drive the bank's transformation in an age of rapid change defined by digitization, fintechs. We just had that wildly successive, uh, successful fintech uh, festival here in Singapore. AI coming to the picture as well. These developments present so much opportunities to investors, but I wonder, do they also present new risks? I think um, if you look at it from two standpoints, one, one is in terms of the processes that we apply internally in the bank, um, what is important is to ensure that the activities that we do are guided by how our customers are interacting with us. So I'll give you an example. We have this year introduced a new financial planning tool. Um, and it was launched and acquired, uh, no fanfare. Uh, we just wanted customers to discover it. And so it is available on a website. I do not know how many of you actually use it. We have close to 1.4 million of our customers who have uh, access that particular website on financial planning. Um, and that is where we use technology to help customers to be able to go through the simple step of going through financial planning, updating how they spend money, what they are doing with their cash, and so on and so forth. So close to about 300 plus thousand of these customers actively use it every month. We're happy to share that about th more than 30,000 of them have moved from people who borrow money to now savers. So it shows that the tool in itself works, and technology is one where you can use to guide people to do things differently. So for us, when we sell a product, uh, clearly fair dealing is one that we abide by. So we go through the whole suitability and appropriateness to allow us to determine the risk appetite of our customers. We risk rate our products. And we use technology through iPads where we guide customers through these questions to allow them to discover and understand um, what is their own risk appetite, understand what they're investing in before they invest it uh, through the, the electronic platform that we provide to them. So from that standpoint, we're using technology to help make the, the process a lot easier while focusing on the key questions that people need to understand. Okay, it would be remiss of me not to bring you into the conversation because I see we have 37 votes for this question, so I will raise it. What are the easiest and safest investment options available for retirees who are not working and want to supplement their daily expenses? First one to the mic gets to answer. 
<laughs> so I must qualify. I've got bunyap in the room. So I, I don't have my uh, RIN, so which means that I am not qualified to be a financial advisor. So I think it's important to put that out there. Yeah, I think Professor... Yeah. Well, I, I guess I can comment. Thanks, uh, I, I guess uh, as an uh, uh, academic, as a researcher, uh, I can talk about you know, uh, uh, investments and planning for retirement and even just using numbers because I do it all the time. Uh, there are two numbers I need people to remember. These are for references. To be a smart investor, you have to equip yourself with a lot of knowledge. And the first number is 3%. And throughout the 80 years of history in the United States, inflation is running at 3%. So if you put your money under the mattress, you are 3% poorer every year. Now, the other number I need you to kind of remember and keep it at the back of your head. This is easy number to remember. Uh, it's about 10%. 10. 10 is an easy number to remember. So 10 is the uh, average return over the last 80 years in the uh, S&P 500 uh, index in the US market. So uh, you can verify that number. You know, just look 80 years, look at the history, what is the cumulative uh, uh, growth rate and 10%. So that means if you blindly, you know, you have a runway of 40 years, uh, assuming, you know, this is me talking to uh, my undergraduate student, the, the day you graduate, the day you work, Right? First paycheck, spend it all, take your parents out to uh, dinner and all your friends, and second paycheck, start paying yourself. And you have 40 years of runway at 10%, basically a $20,000 investment, 40 years later will be almost a million bucks. You know? And that's a million bucks. I mean, 20,000, know, you put aside over uh, 40 years spent investing and not even have to do any homework, just keep it invested in the S&P 500 index, and on average, it will be uh, almost a million bucks. And then, how much is it worth a million bucks 40 years today? You might ask, oh, wow, you know, a million bucks, you know, a big deal, but it's 40 years from now. Well, at the average rate of uh, 3% inflation, right, in today's value, it will be close to $300,000. So simple, uh, you know, just uh, uh, knowing history and knowing how the stock market has been over the last uh, 80 years can guide uh, people's uh, uh, investment. So, you know, so if you ask me, I say, you know, don't even need to think about it. It's actually a very, very uh, uh, simple way of uh, investing for the future. Now, if you are really thinking about, wow, you really want to go in and, and, and beat the market and do what, uh, there are a lot of scientists out there uh, looking at a lot of data, running uh, data on supercomputer, and uh, collectively, uh, a, a lot of investment uh, are being put in into these uh, resources to, uh, to try to even exploit uh, some of these uh, inefficiencies in the market. And uh, we are just... We have a day job, so uh, easier, I think, to just invest in the uh, S&P 500 index. Yeah. So uh, retirees are, uh, don't have time on their side. Uh, for instance, I'm not a retiree, I'm 75 years old. But I don't have time on my side. So I can't take much risk. So I need to look at uh, investments that would be less risky mm. and uh, easy to decipher. And I would go for REITs, plain vanilla, you know, ETFs, index, ETF index, uh, and I will not be looking at high, uh, very high risky investments at all. Uh, Singaporeans, uh, by and large, have been very long time invested in properties. Mm. They, have, they, they, they have been earning passive income from properties, right? So when it comes to SIS and ask us, many retirees come to SIS and ask, can you recommend an investment? Now, we don't have license to recommend. But we can tell generally that, look, because of your age, you, you have to avoid high-risk products, even medium-risk products. You need to have money in the bank. You need to, if, you, if you're really not sure, you know the investment uh, account of uh, CPF gives 4% or 5%. You can, you, yeah, 4%. Yeah, you could put that, put more money into that, and you're sure to get 4%. All right? And if you really have no money, and you are in an HDB flat, you can do a reverse mortgage. All right, so uh, retirees in Singapore are better off in many of the Asian countries. Okay? Well, thank you very much for that. I'm going to combine two questions because collectively they have 30 votes. Uh, there are lots of adult education offerings of programs that come at high prices, about three to 4,000, and they teach consumers 
how to invest in options and stock and forex. Are there any avenues to seek redress from unethical investment educators? Ethical investment educators are money sense and SIS. <laughs> Why are you going for unethical? <laughs> because they see it on YouTube. You just have to go to YouTube and so, it keeps coming so up. This is what you should be avoiding. If somebody is going to teach you, ask you to pay 3000 you know, there's a rat somewhere. Be careful. Because they're going to trap you. You are the rat they're going to trap. And they're going to make you pay for a product. And you end up, they often call us saying that I paid 3005 I paid 4000 I've lost. And this flying by night, you know, they fly by night. They come in, they hold these seminars, they take your money, and then they run off. No need. SIS investment seminars are free. Today, money sense. You see, we have many of these. You don't have to do that. Please don't be greedy. No need to buy these products and hope that you will make a lot of money quickly. You know, DBS, responsible banks. Our three banks are responsible. They have, you know, advisory services. They have financial planners, uh, independent financial planners. For example, Provident, Mr. Christopher Tan, you all know, very often he lectures. Is he here today? He will be yeah. for the so second panel. There are, there are companies and companies which are approved by MAS on the list. Don't be greedy. Forget it. When you see that, don't be tempted. You know, take it, go away. Don't even read it. Put it away. It is all a, a ploy to take your money. I will add that uh, for DBS, we did work with SGX last year, uh, where we did this FLY program, it's financial literacy for you. And there was uh, con there's content, it's on the website, um, to educate uh, everybody about financial planning, about uh, protection. And on our website, we also um, teach you all about what is ETF, what is uh, unit trust, what is a bond. So do go there, take a look at it and understand it. Uh, if there are new instruments, some fancy instruments that are being introduced to you, I think what is important for you to ask is, what uh, are you selling to me? Mm. Uh, understand the product, and uh, actually I really like the video that was shown at the start of the session where you have uh, um, Scam. The, 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 uh, sort of like a skit, right? Where the actor who acted as an auntie uh, essentially talked about, you know, ask why. Um, even ask, where is the gold produced? Uh, how is it being refined? I mean, those are not ridiculous questions, you know. Mm. Um, so it's important to really, really understand um, what you are investing in. And if the person can't even explain to you, then run away. So, you know, you go to the website, SIS website, Money Science and ABS, together with SIS. We have been doing this for 10 years. And we videoed it. And we put it on the website for you, the ABCD of investing in each instrument. All right, from the from stocks right up to forex, all the instruments are there. The do's and don'ts. Experts like him are on the video. You don't need to go and buy products for three thousand, four thousand dollars. Money Sense has paid for these, uh, you know, videos. SIS has put it up on his website for you. Okay. Okay, wonderful. We have two questions about this area, and that's robo-advisors. Panel, what is your opinion about the robo-advisors many claim to provide diversification at low cost and the auto-balancing of portfolios? Well, let me, let me, let me, let me take up this challenge. Okay? So, robo-advisors are, are basically uh, machines. Right? So you key in some of the data uh, about yourself, what you want to do, and it's, uh, it throws out an optimization uh, uh, program. It's basically a risk return a trade off frontier, being on the efficient frontier, given your risk tolerance, what should be uh, uh, your, your mix. But remember, this is very static, right? And our investment uh, portfolio should be dynamic. So every point in time of your life, uh, it can be very different. Uh, and Can they beat human beings? Uh, what? Can these machines beat human beings? No, no. These are these are basically. I mean, they call it robo. And sometimes, sometimes I hear people talk about uh, uh, AI, artificial, artificial intelligence. You know, uh, slash machine learning. A lot of this stuff are mainly all machine. You know, machines are like computers. I like to think about 
these things are forklift. You know, in the past, we can't do a lot of things that we want to do, especially on the research side, because the computers are not fast enough. So these days, the computers are really fast. You can do a lot of data analytics, and we just basically put this technology to bed. But behind the scene, a lot of this, you know, uh, don't get taken by just what robo advisors and whatnot. It is the same thing. It's just, you know, now you have faster, uh, faster machine uh, to do this. So robo advisors, in some instances, they promise you that, and, and this is not in Singapore, but in other markets, where they talked about, oh, there is an AI behind that will take in a lot of data. Um, and because they are able to take in a lot of data, they can sense where the market is going and therefore they will invest automatically on your behalf. I think what is important in, in any form of AI is to make sure that the company that's offering it is able to explain to you how it works. Um, because at the end of the day, the how is very important. Um, when you understand the how, it's got to be explainable to you what it is all about. So in the case of uh, uh, DBS, we did offer something that's called a digi portfolio, But that essentially just simply means that it is not a machine, but it's one where we go on a diversified basis. That says, this is what we are investing in. It's very clear. Um, and the investment performance, and if you're investing in it, this is what it will do. Um, and, uh, and so those are the things that are out there. But you definitely, like in any kind of uh, investment activity, you have to ask, how does this work? And I think that is a very important question to ask. Okay, another question here, this time for, I, I think the two lawyers on the panel can take this one. Uh, what is CS and MAS doing about some recent failures of auditors to spot problems in companies early, like High Flux, for example? ACRA is on top of this. I think ACRA is one that uh, monitors auditors and they, you know, we are fortunate in one sense that we have auditing of the auditors. Uh, now, ACRA does that in some cases. They go into an audit firm by surprise and then they look at what they're doing. So um, uh, we have in practice, uh, very fortunate in practice, we have ACRA on top of this. All right? So um, what are they doing about it? If they find there are shortfalls, they are dealt with by ACRA. Okay. I want to turn our attention to bond markets for a moment. Financial professionals generally advise having a mix of stocks and bonds in your portfolio. Uh, Prof Go, maybe you can help us out here. How informative, because you've written about bond ratings and valuations, so how informative are these bond ratings? Do you think that investors who are hungry for high yields are going to pay the ratings no heed whatsoever? Yes. Uh, you know, this, uh, if you are a bond investor, uh, and bond is not for everybody. Uh, if you are a young uh, individual in your 20s and 30s, you know you don't really need the bond. Bond are more defensive in uh, in nature. So as you progress and you are you have accumulated uh, enough, um, by the time you are uh, close to retirement, uh, you adjust your asset allocation. Then you have bonds in there. When we start thinking about invest in bonds then the ratings becomes uh, critical because you have ratings that go from triple A, that means it's very, very safe, uh, all the way down to, let's say, triple B, and it's still safe, but this type of bonds are called investment-grade bonds. So the yields are uh, uh, somewhat lower because uh, uh, normally uh, this type of bonds uh, typically don't, don't fail that often. But once you cross that border into uh, the double B uh, category, then... Uh, those bonds can be risky and as a result, the yield tends to be high. So when you're buying bonds, you're not just thinking about, the, oh, I, I, I buy bonds. You have to look at really the ratings and, and the yields and the uh, bond ratings are highly correlated. Just to and clarify, we don't have bond ratings here yet. Is there a uh, work group that's looking into this? Uh, yes, we are starting our work group to look into uh, retail bonds and bond ratings is one of the matters being considered. So Singapore is unique in that Singapore is the biggest retail, bonds are sold to retail investors, all right? So from the high flux uh, example, you know, we, we, we really feel that retail investors are walking into a you know, minefield because they do not know much about the bonds and it's not rated. Uh, so they got to go and do research on the company that is issuing the, the bond, which they don't do as well. So there is now uh, attention being paid by SGX and SIS 
and other industry partners into how we can help retail investors. Okay, here's a question for the entire panel, and it's so human, this question, I have to bring it up. Uh, there is so much information out there. Is it easier or harder to make smart investment decisions today? You can't be a smart investor if you do not have disclo good disclosures to, to go by. You, what is Singapore is a caveat emptor market, me meaning buyer beware. You have to beware of what you're going to do, what is available to you. You need to understand the disclosures. And if you don't understand, you need to ask questions. And you still don't understand, walk away. Don't invest in that investment. So uh, you need to discern and you need to have good financial information and you need to understand the information. Did you want to add? Yeah, I just want to add, um, I don't think the position has changed whether it was five years ago, 10 years ago or now in terms of uh, what the investor needs to be a smart investor and it's not so much how much information there is, it's finding the trusted sources of information and you can rely on them. So Sias has a lot of information and resources on its website. In that case, it's much better for retail investors today and with the web access to uh, research reports and to academic research, you have a lot of credible, trusted information you can rely on and that makes it better for the investor today. Okay, well speaking about confusion and so much information out there, even as we talk about innovation and change, we can't forget different segments of the population uh, like the elderly. So how are our banks looking at serving the needs of the elderly population? Or more largely, how are banks evolving to meet new needs of customers? So for us, uh, we have an uh, uh, active program in uh, educating the elderly. So we work very closely with uh, the uh, uh, C3A, um, essentially to employ what we call uh, the POSB uh, senior program to teach a lot of our elderly customers when they come to the branch how the technology actually works and how they can use technology to serve uh, their financial needs. Um, we work with PA and as well as IMDA to educate the community. So we go into the community, again, reaching out to the elderly, to um, anyone who's interested to learn more about financial planning, to guide them and to teach them. And I think all these are very important. And also from a language perspective, we are currently actually running a series with Lian Ha Chao Pao. Um, where we are reaching out to the uh, Mandarin-speaking population to uh, run videos, their five-part videos, again, about financial planning, uh, what you should do when you talk about financial wellness. See, so I think education is really, really important. important yeah. And when the customers come in to buy a product, um, it is important to go through with the customers, understanding their horizon and as well as their risk appetite. Mm. Uh, clearly, some instruments are not suited for the yeah. elderly. So for the elderly citizens, CIAS has a program. We go to the constituencies at the request of the mayors and the MPs. We take our experts and teach them how to manage their money and how, what to look out for and not to jump into investments and also to be aware of financial abuse. Sometimes, you know, children out of good heart and, uh, you know, goodwill, they come to you and say, Papa, you got two million in the bank, let me invest. And then after a few years, Papa, you got no money. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> because they're all financial advisors, <laughs> okay, self-made financial advisors, unfortunately, it turns out bad. And then they come to see us, and ask, can you help us? So, the other thing is that they, we guide them on what, how to manage the money, right? How much to keep, and when somebody says, let me invest for you, alarm bells rings. You are now 80 years old, you don't need to invest, all right? You need to manage the money carefully. You need to have people to help you, and that's where we have financial planners. If not, come to see us, we will help you. Okay, this is a popular question as well. Like, what is your view, panel, on the advancement of cryptocurrencies versus fiat currencies? We hear about Facebook Libra and other coins. Is this going to affect our society? I don't know anything about cryptocurrency. And so you're I don't, not investing? I am not going to look at it because I don't know who is promoting it. Uh, how safe is it? How do I go after them if things go wrong? See, it's very difficult. So it is not for us, it's for somebody else. 
Well, I've just been told that our time is up, ladies and, well, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. Round of applause for the wonderful panel. Thank you.